Okay, we're exploring this unpronounceable name, Habakkuk, <laughs> but we'll slip back to our Americanization of it. We call it Habakkuk. Um, and we'll start, we're going to have all three chapters tonight. It's a, a short little book, and uh, we'll whip through it uh, reasonably diligently, I think. But let's start, if you remember, if you've studied to learn the Bible in 24 hours, you remember this chart that lists all the kings. After Solomon died, there was a civil war. The southern kingdom, commonly called Judah, the house of Judah, and their kings are listed there, all in one dynasty, David, the Davidic dynasty, obviously. Uh, the northern uh, group went into idolatry, and their kings went from bad to worse. And uh, they ultimately go into the Assyrian captivity. The southern kingdom goes into the Babylonian captivity. It was only for a duration, a seven-year dur duration. To, make, to talk about this in a little more detail, I'm going to just segment this and take the lower half of this diagram and expand it a little bit. Okay. Now, what we're interested in doing is looking at the, the history here. The city of Nineveh is a Gentile city that, be, that is a target of some of these prophets. We'll get to that. It's the capital of Assyria, but Assyria eventually gets captivated by one of its cities. One of its cities, Babylon, grew to be its own empire and, and takes over. Um, the, but the point is, after uh, uh, along the way here, the northern kingdom falls in 721 to the Assyrians. From that day on, it disappears from history. It gets diffused. And, uh, but uh, the southern kingdom also ultimately goes into the Babylonian captivity. And, uh, uh, but that's only for, they're, they're, they go into it with a promise that after 70 years, they will be freed. And uh, now what you need to understand, many people don't realize, Babylon rises to power, it takes over the Assyrian Empire. And so those captives become Babylonian slaves. So the captives get commingled. So the, even though you're talking about the southern kingdom, there aren't ten tribes that are lost. The faithful long ago migrated to the south. Those that were interested in idolatry had migrated to the north anyway. But a little background there. Following the Babylonian captivity, we enter what's called the exile, the post, I should say the post-exile period, and uh, under Zerubbabel and what have you. Now, uh, 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 what we're going to take a look here, up in the north we have a prophet by the name of Elisha. Elijah was in First Kings region. We're now in the Second Kings period. And Elisha, but he's not, he didn't leave writing, so he's aside from our discussion here. The major prophets, the prophets that have the, lar the, the major and minor are terms used by librarians. The major prophets are the big, lengthy writings. And we call those major prophets, okay? And that consists of Isaiah, Je uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. There are four major prophets, five books, because there's a little appendage on Jeremiah called Lamentations. Okay, those are the major prophets. And, and now Isaiah... Uh, and uh, and uh, Jeremiah are indicated on the diagram going from Jotham down to Manasseh. Jeremiah picks it up about the time of Josiah to the end. Daniel and Ezekiel prophesy during the Babylonian captivity. Daniel is deported in the first group. Ezekiel in the second group. And in the third group causes the city to be burned out. There are three, there are three things. We'll get into that later. Now, the reason I get into this, I, those are the major prophets. What I, I want to try to unravel here a little bit is confusion about what we call the minor prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. That's the way they typically are listed in your Bible, which as far as I can tell, I can't figure why. I'll tell you for another reason. Let's take a look at the Hosea prophesied to the northern kingdom roughly in the days of Jeroboam II. No problem there. Joel, the next one listed, was a little earlier, but in the, prophesying to the southern kingdom, the house of Judah, the days of Amaziah, roughly. And there's good scholars that have slightly different estimates of the exact timing here, because it, is, it isn't necessarily crisp. Amos joins... Hosea was really a prophet from the south, but he was targeted. God sent him to the north to lay down his case to the north. Amos... His content is about the same period, the same kind of thing. So Hosea and Amos are the two prophets that really focus on the northern kingdom and its problems. Now, we then get to uh, Obadiah. Uh, that's in the south, near the end, almost before the exile. Uh, Jonah is sent to Nineveh. Okay, he's got nothing to do with any of this. He's gone to Nineveh, the enemy of Israel, and gets them to repent and get 
pick up a whole century of forbearance there. And uh, then we get to, uh, after uh, Jonah, uh, we have Micah, and that's roughly the time of Isaiah. Um, Nahum is sent to the same place Jonah was a century later, and they don't repent, and that causes them, he predicts that they are going to fall, and they do, to Babylon, and that ri that's the rise of the Babylonian Empire. And so both Jonah and Nahum, their focus is in Nineveh. One was successful, the other, uh, there was no repentance. Okay. Okay, now we have Habakkuk, and that's what we're going to deal with tonight, and he's roughly uh, in the time of Jeremiah or following. Uh, Zephaniah is also uh, roughly the time of Manasseh, the, that really bad king. Uh, we have uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Those three are post-exile prophets. They do fit together because they both dealt in that period with its unique problems. So the point is, why are these in the order they are in the Bible? I have no idea. It is complicated, and that was somebody had some reason, and they did it, and that's fine. That's where you have it in your Bible. But meanwhile, uh, let's continue. After the exile, we have 400 years between Malachi and the New Testament. And those are called the silent years because it doesn't appear in the Bible. Wrong. They are in the Bible. Most people don't know where to look, okay? Because it turns out that those years are profiled in Daniel chapter 11 from verse 5 to 35 with such precision and such accuracy that the skeptics of the Bible say they had to be written later and after the fact and that's nonsense because they were translated into Greek three centuries before Christ was born. So that was, that was a real trick to have them written and translated several centuries earlier. But anyway, <laughs> the point is they are in the Bible in a way that's uh, in, in a prophetic profile. Okay, so we're going to look at Habakkuk and he's during the time of Josiah, the, one of the, the uh, last of the good kings and uh, from there it goes from bad to worse till they go into exile. And uh, we'll talk about that as we go. Now, it's interesting, in my view, if you took these, a more logical ordering would be as follows. Uh, the northern, in fact, let's take a look at it. In the northern kingdom, we have Hosea and Amos. They both are dealing with the same time and the same problems, pretty much. A little different attack on both of them. Nineveh, of course, is Jonah when they did repent. Nahum later when they don't, and they go, they're out of the picture. The southern kingdom, the house of Judah, as we call it, has five prophets, minor prophets. Joel, Micah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk and Obadiah. And uh, then we have the post-exile, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So that's just a way of clustering these, and that's the way we're going to try to cluster our product packages in that grouping, which is different than you have it in your Bible. So uh, be that as it may, we're here tonight to explore this brief little book, little short three-chapter book called Habakkuk. And that's what we're up to now. His name means to embrace. Interesting. Embrace in the sense of caring for and comforting and so forth. He records his own experience of soul with God. He's the initiator, raising questions, and God is responding. That's very different, by the way. Usually it's the other way around. God calls the prophets, Hosea or whoever, and sends them on a mission. Or Jonah sends them on a mission. He goes the other way until God explains it more clearly, and, and, and that's another thing. But okay, the main theme here, as is uh, throughout many of the Psalms and so forth, is God's consistency with himself in view of permitted evil. How can a good God be allowing evil to continue? That's, that's an enigma that really troubles Habakkuk. The affliction of the godly, and, and, the, and the, in contrast, that the prosperity of the ungodly. You know, why, why do the godly suffer, and why do the ungodly prosper? That's, that's got Habakkuk really confused. And, uh, uh, and the, the main theme is God's consistency with himself in view of permitted evil. How many of you have ever wondered about that? Okay, most of the hands are up, and it should be. Gotcha. Why do bad things happen to good people is a simple way of putting that into focus. This is technically classified as a theodicy. What does that mean? It's a defense of God's goodness and omnipotence in view of evil. It has a fancy name. So, you know, it's a, a, a metaphors reign where mysteries reside. So if you don't really understand it, you give it a fancy name and that hides the facts. You don't really understand the answer. Okay. But Habakkuk is among the last of the so-called minor prophets that preach in Judah before the Babylonian captivity. So that's going to be his theme all along. 
to look at the timeline another way, this you may re recall from uh, learning the Bible in 24 hours, you have from Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon, then the two kingdoms split up. The southern kingdom lasts longer, the northern kingdom goes, uh, you know, drops out earlier. By books, we've got 1 Samuel goes to the time of Saul, then 2 Samuel is the time of David, and then after 1 Kings picks up Solomon, right up to, uh, 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 well, 1 and 2 Kings take it on to the end. And 1 Chronicles cover David. There, it's roughly parallel in time with 2 Samuel, with a little different emphasis. And then 2 Chronicles takes it on to the end. Okay. So uh, the, uh, we have the Assyrian exile first, the Babylonian exile that follows. And we're going to focus our attentions roughly in that period when Assyria has fallen already, but Babylon is about to take them in captive. And part of the message that comes th through is the, the southern kingdom, the house of Judah, has no excuse. They should have learned the lesson by watching what happened to the north. The north didn't get it, got wiped out. And the prophet is saying, hey, you guys, wake up. If we don't repent, same thing's going to happen to us. And that's, what we're, that's the flavor of what we're going to run into here. So something else to understand, the Babylon uh, uh, dominance is involved with three sieges. The first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, the second siege and the third siege. The first one starts the servitude of the nation for 70 years. Good deal. Okay. This third siege, if they see if they don't, if, if he puts a, a, a vassal king in charge, and then uh, that vassal king turns on him, so he replaces. Second siege replaces him, and the false prophets are saying, "Gee, you got, we're God's chosen. God's going to deliver us." And that's the false prophets. Jeremiah here in Jerusalem and Ezekiel in Babylon are both saying, "Don't do it." Nebuchadnezzar is God's instrument of, of judgment. If you, don't, if you don't yield to him, he's going to destroy Jerusalem, which on the third siege he does. That starts the desolations of Jerusalem. It also goes 70 years, but they're not coterminous. That is, they each have a different starting point. They both have a different ending point. But the termination of each is exactly 70 years to the day when it started, interestingly enough. That's very complicated to determine, but turns out to be true. Anyway, the, the servitude nation is comes ends with the rise of the Persian Empire conquering Babylon, and that starts the uh, the you know the Persian Empire under the uh, uh, decree of, of uh, Cyrus. They 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 are freed to go back and build their temple, but they don't get very far because they're harassed all the time until Nehemiah, who his king, gives him the permission to rebuild the the wall and all that. That's that's the decree of Artaxerxes, and that happens to trigger the seventy week prophecy of Daniel. So that those are very, very pivotal events in history. Second Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah are the books that cover this period and more particularly. Esther falls roughly, we think, about the end of the, 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 the time of the book of es, uh, Ezra. The three prophets of the, the Babylonian uh, uprise here is Jeremiah, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk. Daniel and Ezekiel are prophets, but Daniel is in Babylon, and Ezekiel is in Babylon when they prophesy. And uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are, as you, you know, post-exile prophets. So that's just a perspective of the total. Habakkuk is what our primary interest in, so let's jump in. Uh, there are interesting New Testament quotes, by the way. Paul's fantastic prophecy in Acts 13 really draws quotations from Habakkuk chapter 1 we're going to run into. There are three books of the Bible. Romans, Galatians, and Hebrew that are basically a trilogy on a particular verse from Habakkuk chapter 2. We'll deal with that when we get there. And there's also some passages in Philippians 4 that are uh, in, uh, uh, quoted in uh, are quotes from Habakkuk 3. Now Habakkuk probably lived about the 12th or 13th year of the reign of Hose Josiah. He was a good guy. Probably written about 609 BC during the reign of Jehoiakim. And these were dark, troubling times. The nation is facing, within a few years, conquest by Babylon. God is going to use Babylon as an instrument of judgment. And that's what's puzzling Habakkuk. We'll get into that. Babylon formed an axis with the Medes to overthrow the Assyrians. And they'd continue to rise under generalship, and then later kingship of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king. Nebuchadnezzar was the general. But he's so sharp, and he, when his father, father dies, he takes over. But in a lot of his big successes were while his father was still alive. And so, uh, anyway, uh, Habakkuk was probably a priest before he was called as a prophet, because his last verse of his book 
mentions his stringed instruments. That's a hint that he probably was one of the priests. And that, uh, Jeremiah was about, lived about the same time, and he also was a priest before being a prophet. And uh, it's interesting, his book is not being initiated by God in the ministry, but rather he is initiating a dialogue with God about the ministry. So he's the initiator, and God is the responder, which is a very unusual posture here. And at the beginning of his ministry, he saw the revival of the days of King Josiah. And we'll, get, we'll explain what that is here in a minute. Hezekiah was a pretty good king. He succeeded by Manasseh, who was the worst of the lot. He tried to wipe out Judaism. He destroyed every copy of the Torah he could find. He tried to wipe out Judaism. But one copy was hidden, and that gets discovered shortly. But in the meantime, he succeeded by this young kid. Uh, one of the, he turns out to be one of the better kings of, of Judah. He began to reign at the age of eight. He sought the Lord at the age of 16. When he's 26, he ordered the temple to be remodeled, and a copy of the law was found by Hilkiah the priest uh, in a corner. Um, there was not another copy in the entire land. But they found this copy, and Josiah reads it or has it read to him, whatever, and he's stunned to realize how far they've fallen. And so that starts a revival under Josiah. And, uh, and so he called the people to seek the Lord he, and to institute the festivals and feasts of, the, of Israel once again. They had, been not, they had not been uh, observing those for quite a while. He finally dies in a battle by, with Pharaoh Necho of Egypt in the plain of Megiddo in 609 B.C. And there's a whole story behind that you need to understand because it illuminates the location of the Ark of the Covenant today. But that's another thing. Uh, but anyway, after his death, which of course disillusioned the people because he was so popular, uh, that disillusionment uh, with the reform set in and Judah reverted back to their former ways. So he does have a revival, but it's relatively short-lived. Jeremiah and, uh, in, in Jerusalem and Ezekiel in Babylon both describe this period in great detail. Now the reign of Josiah was 640 to about 609. He allowed, the, he allowed the people to enjoy a greater degree of prosperity than had been possible in previous years. And ignoring the spiritual dimensions, they thought the new era would last indefinitely. They didn't understand the prosperity was deriving from the repentance. They thought they were doing it, though God was doing it. The realities that faced them, however, could not have been anticipated either by political liberals or the religiously minded conservatives. Couldn't have visualized it. While all this is going on, the power of Assyria, which had ruled that region for quite a while, started to collapse. Political supremacy belonged to Egypt. Strong That's why the Levites sought refuge under Pharaoh Necho for the Ark of the Covenant in that period. But anyway, um, strong political ties, however, had been established with the emergent kingdom of Babylon. And as a vassal of Egypt on the one hand and a friend of Babylon on the other, there seemed to be no serious threat to prosperity on the horizon. Not so. The leaders of the people had ignored the spiritual reasons for their prosperity. And by, do you see a parallel in America? Do you see a parallel? We think that we were prosperous because we're so smart or fill in the blank. No. It's because of, of spiritual conditions that have been abandoned. Okay. Alexis de Tocqueville is famous for remarking when he studied America. Democracy in America was his famous publication back then. He said, America is great because she's good. If America ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Really? How, how prophetic. See, now the rich exploit the poor. Greed and avarice characterize the times. There and here. Perversions of all kinds are openly promoted and protected by law. Is that talking about Habakkuk's time or talking about today? As we go, you're going to, have, it's, you're going to see that they are in step with each other. Real power is increasingly concentrated among a, a, an elite few then and today. So Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah were on the scene calling the people to true spirituality. And you can argue that there, though that call is still echoing in our halls today. Now King Jehoiakim then follows Josiah and so forth, and uh, he was an evil king. And from, in fact, from here they get bad to worse until they finally go into captivity. Now between Josiah and Jehoiakim was Jehoaz, but he only lasted three months. But that's why he's still on the list and what have you. 
His reign is characterized by injustice and bloodshed. He, he burned an initial scroll by Jeremiah. And Jeremiah then prophesied an even bleaker future for Judah. He thought by burning the message it wouldn't be true anymore, really. <laughs> Habakkuk wonders while all this is going on, Lord, why don't you judge your people? Habakkuk starts out with a question mark, and he's going to finish chapter 3 with an exclamation point. He starts out confused, and he comes out awed by God. He starts out wrestling with God, and he ends up worshiping Him. That's where we ought to be. Sure, start out wrestling with Him. Jacob did. Had a limp after that, but all right. Um, anyway, let's just jump in. Verse 1, the burden, or massa, if you will, uh, 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 is, a, is a load to be lifted, in other words. Uh, heavy judgments is coming. The burden which uh, Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. And in other words, it seems like God is permitting all these bad things to go on. The word violence, by the way, now the word cry up there, how long shall I cry, is actually, the word is scream in the Hebrew. And uh, you ever feel that way, by the way? <laughs> Besides being in traffic. No, I mean, okay. The word violence, by the way, might interest you. That's the word Hamas. Interesting. It's an adverbial accusative. It actually means violence, cruelty, injustice, and oppressor. And that, of course, is the label of the primary uh, southern terrorist group today. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there, there are that raise up strife and contention. It says, I look around this nation, all I see is violence and contention. Why aren't you doing something about it, Lord? You ever have that feeling? Well, if you do, this book's for you. Sounds like our own nightly news broadcast, doesn't it? Do you realize uh, the most violent city in the world is now Washington, D.C.? Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. The word slack by means paralyzed, chilled. The law is paralyzed. law is ineffectual. Unrighteous judges. The law said it not. Life and property are insecure. And by the way, you can never uh, have liberty without free pro property and liberty are inextricably linked. You need to just understand that and think that through and understand that. Property rights are integral with personal liberty. They're not two separate subjects. Well, and, and certainly the wicked know how to pervert the judicial process. Have you noticed that? Yeah, okay. The average capital offender before he's executed will spend 22 years in legal procedures at a cost of $1.8 million each. Suicide rate among police is four times greater than that of society in general. Not surprising, really. Out of every thousand violent crimes committed in this country, only 2.4 criminals are ever brought to justice. 2.4 out of a thousand. Wow. Most of our social changes are brought about by court decision, not laws voted on. Busing, affirmative action, elevation and promotion of sexual perversion, all those things derive from our court processes, not from the legislature. That's a violation of the separation of powers, actually, and on and on and on. Have you ever wondered why governments always seem to tend toward corruption? As a systems engineer, I never understood that until I got this diagram I'm about to show you. I didn't understand. I, didn't. I realized it, and yet I don't understand why. Why do governments tend to get corrupt? Why are we surprised? Governments have always loved crises. Why? Well, crises provide the rationale for two things. Increasing budgets and bureaucracies, obviously, and also for subjugating the liberties of the population. Every time your liberties are lost, it's always some very worthwhile banner. It's to solve some apparent crisis. We've got to institute these things. Okay. See, in, in dictatorships, dictators understand this. They always create external crises to consolidate their internal powers. When a dictator comes over, he's got to create a crisis to consolidate his own hold on what's going on. Okay. Now, in our country, we've long learned that social crises work just as well as military ones. The war on poverty, whatever. No, no, no child left behind. They always have 
There's one insight that supplies the key missing link that I never realized. If social crises, uh, if governments are favored by social crises, how do you get social crises? By promoting immorality. Immorality results in social crises. Okay? So let's diagram the dynamic here. Governments love military crises. Why? Because they increase budgets and so forth, right? Well, it turns out that military cri social crises work just as well. The social crises will increase budget and give you bureaucracy, hire more people, whatever. Well, how do you get social crises from immorality? Ah, now I understand. That's why governments promote immorality because that will produce the social crises that allow governments to grow. And guess what happens? That's what happens. Everything grows bigger. More immorality, more social crisis, bigger budgets, more government, more immorality, and on it goes. From 1963 on, you've got the free sex, and you've got the, sh the, the, the shredding of the home and the family, and you can go build your list. Anyway, now, if, going back to, uh, to Habakkuk, if an organism or a country cannot deal with its infections quickly and effectively, it will die of infection. So in Jerusalem, too, they could not deal with it, justice and equity fairly, quickly and simply. If they had, it would have been repairable. No, no. Habakkuk verse 5, uh, 1 verse 5. Behold ye among the heathen in regard and wonder marvelously. God speaking, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. What a fabulous verse. No wonder Paul quotes it so articulately in Acts 13. Behold, in regard, and wonder, Mark, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, even though I told you. I wonder how much that's going to be true in our life. I wonder how much of the next few months or few years are things that we can read about today if we knew where to look. Behold ye among the heathen. That who is he talking about here? This verse anticipates, but this is an interesting verse, because this verse anticipates dispersion of the Jews among the heathen. Habakkuk is talking to the Jews. But behold ye among the heathen. He's anticipating that they're going to be dispersed. And he's not talking about Babylon. He's talking about a dispersion later. What we're going to get confused by is... He's going to get some things that are near and some things that are further and they get commingled sometimes. Let's watch for that. While Israel as a nation is thus dispersed, yod heh if I use the rabbinical phrase, will work a work which Israel will not believe. No kidding. Isn't that right? Paul quotes this to the Jews of the dispersion at Antioch. It's Acts 13, attributing the prediction to the redemptive work of Christ. Paul applies it that way. This verse... He applies there, and it goes even beyond there, as we'll see. What I'm, there's a concept of prophetic perspectives you need. A prophet may see two different things in the, in the same glimpse. He sees some, an early event, and it echoes in, a, in advance a later event. And there is a time gap between these two, like two hills that are separated, but they're in a distance, so you, you're not sensitive to the distance between them. The first one we call a type. The following one we call an antitype, which is simply something that is anticipated in a type. But prophecy is full of these. Some people call it a double fulfillment. It's got all kinds of labels, and most of those labels are misleading. But the point is, this is a phenomenon that we see in the prophetic literature. The early event, a time gap, eclipsing uh, uh, a, or, you know, a, a larger event later. And we're going to see that all the way through here. We're going to see a regathering of Babylon. After they're, they're going into Babylon, they get promised to regathered. But the regathering promise also talks about their being regathered from the entire world, which is what we're seeing happen in our lifetime. Okay. Let's continue with verse 5. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it be told you. What does that really mean? Don't call, count God out. Stand back and watch, God is saying. Okay. He deals with the worldwide dispersion in verse 5. He's going to deal with the impending captivity of Babylon in the next verse. That's what, if, you, if you're not paying attention, it's easy to get confused here. Okay. Probably at this time, Babylon was still friendly with them. And uh, in 2 Kings 20, 
and they visited Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, that was back in the days of Hezekiah. And, and he, didn't, uh, he did a stupid thing. He showed them all his treasures bragging. That's like showing uh, you know, uh, the neighborhood thief the neat places you've hidden all your valuables in your house. Let me show you where I got all this good stuff. Oh, really? Let me take notes. You know? Okay. Three sieges will follow from Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. And we covered that in the pre-brief on here. And he, see, God bypasses our puny understanding. He's going to deal with all this. Habakkuk seems to apply, try me. Okay, verse 6. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. See, he switched, come, not the whole world. I was talking about the, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians coming. I will raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. In other words, they're going to come and conquest the Chaldeans. They're the inhabitants of Babylonia, of Semitic origin, and uh, so on. In 626, Nabopolassar, who's the king of Babylon, came to the throne. In 606, within 20 years, his son, Nebuchadnezzar, defeated Pharaoh Necho at the Battle of Karshemesh and established the Neo-Babylonian Empire of Daniel chapter 2. Assyria by then had become irrelevant. They were the power in the, in the neighborhood. And, and Habakkuk, God tells Habakkuk, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves out of their own pride. They're, gonna, they're arrogant, in other words. Their, their horses are swifter than the leopards. The, uh, they, they, they pioneered cavalry. Uh, others had chariots, but they used cavalry in a very in innovative way. That's one reason they got very powerful. Anyway, their horses are swifter than leopards. They are more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen shall spread themselves. Their horsemen shall come from afar. Uh, they shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come up for all violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn to them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall... Heap dust and take it. In other words, exploiting bulwarks to capture walled cities is the illusion here. Okay? Heap dust meaning they, 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 that's their way of breaching a, a walled city. And then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this, his power, unto his God. Now this is a classic passage for the characters of the Chaldeans. Just as Isaiah 5 was for the Assyrians, there's a good parallel here, but anyway, God is already preparing the Chaldeans to be his rod of punishment. And that's going to confuse Habakkuk even further. I mean, we're, we're supposed to be the good guys, and you're, you, God, are going to use these mean ruffins to be your instrument of judgment? Yeah. And they'll get theirs later, is the point. Anyway. Then his mind shall change and so forth. Fulfillment of Moses' warning in Deuteronomy 28. The purpose of the invaders is to perpetuate violence in the land, and this was Israel's sin, and it will be her punishment. She perpetuates violence, violence is going to be her, her, her meat. And Feinberg says, for one to make his own strength his God is to commit suicide of the soul. That's fine. Feinberg, there are times Feinberg is really quite eloquent. I like that. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. He's right about that. O oh Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. And Almighty God, thou hast established them for correction. He's, he, he doesn't understand. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? See, the Babylonians are wiping out people that are less unrighteous as the wipeouts, but the point is he, that's still God's judgment. And makest men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them, they take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net, and they gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice under their net, they burn incense under their drag, because they, by them their portion is fat, and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net, and not spare continually to slay the nations? See, Habakkuk is really struggling here. He's saying, God, you can't be serious. You can't use them. They're even worse than we are. <laughs> wow. Yet he knows the nature of the covenant-keeping God who will not allow his people to be wiped out. He knows they're not going to be wiped out, and yet he's puzzled by what's going on here. 
God's going to protect them as he does the Magog invasion in the, in the days of Esther. You know, you, you, a lot of examples where God, either openly or behind the scenes, is protecting his people. And we're going to see how he deals with, with uh, Habakkuk's questions in chapter 2. Are you ready? Let's go to chapter 2. Okay. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Now, this, is, this isn't necessarily a literal tower. It can be, but that's the real point. It's the state of mind. Habakkuk's going to stand back and watch and try to understand what's going on here. So it's, it's a, this is Hezekiah, chapter 2 is Hezekiah and his tower. And uh, the uh, prophets are compared to watchmen in a number of places. We don't have to chase those down. There's three key components to Habakkuk's posture here. First, determination. He didn't say maybe next week I'll th or when it's convenient I'll find the time. No, no, no. He did it right now. Secondly, he got in isolation, away from all the distractions. He turned off the radio, the TV, the telephone. We often can't hear the voice of God because there's too many other voices that are constantly ringing in our ears. So what we're looking at here, the tower is a quiet time, a quiet place, and perhaps most important, a quiet heart. That's what Habakkuk is doing. And that's what, our, that's what our call should be. And then the third part is expectation. Habakkuk says, I will see what the Lord will say to me. Not might, hope, or I wish. No, I will see. Don't say, I hope I'll see. I might see. I wish he'd tell me. No, no, no. He, he's determined. He's isolated. He has, I will see what the Lord will say to me. Okay. There are many ways to please God, but never apart from faith. That's Hebrews 11.6. If you haven't memorized it, you need to do that. Let's go on. Verse 2. And the Lord said, un, answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon the tables, that he may run that readeth it. God's saying, Habakkuk, you're ready to do business. Take a memo. <laughs> okay? That he may run that readeth it. In other words, as a messenger of the vision. By the way, are you really serious when you pray with God? How many of you pray to God? How many think you're serious when you pray to God? I'm gonna, next question, you don't have to show your hands. How many of you take a pad? When you go before God, do you take a pad and pencil? If you've ever been in a large organization, have you ever seen an executive secretary go into the, office bo the uh, boss's office without a pad? Never. A professional secretary, if he calls quickly, she'll grab a pad. She never goes in there without a pad. Always prepared for an assignment or some numbers or something to follow through. So, do you seek the Lord with paper and pencil in your hand? Question. Don't have to show me your hands. Does an executive secretary ever enter a boss's office? With a, you know, so, you know, think about that. I watch my wife. She never, in her devotions and prayer. She's always got a pad, and she's got a journal, and she, keep, you know, she really tracks that stuff. I won't lie about what I do. We'll just go on. Verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, and at the end of it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. In other words, God saying, be patient, don't panic. God has set a bound to all which displeases him. Is America exporting everything that God abhors? Absolutely. How long do you think that'll last? There is a point where even God will say enough already. Behold, a soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now, by the way, we've just stumbled into what has to be one of the most profound verses in the entire Bible. Habakkuk 2.4. It deals with two groups of people. Many people miss this. Those whose soul is lifted up. Don't think they're saved. Those are the ones that are not saved. Those whose soul is lifted up is not upright in him. And those who, who live by faith. Whose soul is not upright? The Babylonians' pride. The, the pride leads to death because it will not receive by faith the grace of God. Look at their leader, Nebuchadnezzar. He stands on the wall and brags how he did all this and he gets struck down for what, seven years? 
By the way, when we're in heaven, I believe we'll see him there. At the end of seven years, he posts his testimony throughout the entire known world. It's, it's called Daniel chapter 4. It was written by Nebuchadnezzar. Read it sometime. It's fabulous. The Talmud declares 613 precepts given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai are there summarized. The vision. To the watching prophet comes the vision with three elements. And that's what's going to constitute the rest of this, book, this chapter. The moral judgment of Yorivave on the evils of dispersed er Israel. The future purpose of God that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow. That's in verse 14. And meanwhile... The just shall live by faith. Now, who are the just? What is the word just? Tzadig. Just, lawful, righteous. In government, judge, right in one's cause. Just and righteous in conduct and character. Righteous is justified and vindicated by God. You can hammer this all you like. You can't escape this pure idea of what is just, lawful, or righteous. Okay, so far? The just shall live. The word echaya. It's to live, to have life, remain alive, sustain life, live prosperously, live forever, be quickened, be alive, restored. To, these are all out of lexicons. To cause to grow, to cause to, re to revive, to preserve man alive. To quicken, revive, or restore to health. To revive, or restore to life. Okay. By what? By faith. Amuna. Firmness, fidelity, steadfastness, steadiness. It's not some vacant belief structure. No, it's a concept of reliance. Relying on. The devils also believe and tremble, James reminds us. Just believing isn't the point. It's relying on it. And what are you believing in? What are you relying on? I mean, by faith, not by intellect, sight, or feelings or touch. Faith is the currency of eternity, and God wants us to be rich people. We need to be weaned, of course. The just shall live by faith. I want to take this phrase and focus on it very carefully because it will give you a huge illumination of the New Testament. That phrase, the just shall live by faith, appears in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. It's the key verse of the book of Romans because the epistle to the Romans, Paul defines justification. Who are the just? Romans is the book that nails it. Okay, the just shall do what? The just shall live by faith. That appears in Galatians 3.11. The just shall live. How shall they live? That's what the Galatians epistle talks about. Not by living, not living by ex religious externalism, but by walking in the Spirit. The just shall live by what? By faith. And that's in Hebrews 10.38. Each Romans, Galatians, and Hebrew are a trilogy on Habak 2.4. And you'll understand those epistles if you understand the central theme of each epistle. Who are the just? How shall they live? And by what? By faith. And, and, and by the way... Hebrews 10.38 is the verse just before the famous hall of faith, as we call it, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Do you see a design here? Now the point is, Paul wrote this trilogy on Habakkuk 2.4, which, among other things, tells you who wrote the epistle to Hebrews. I'm stunned to discover, the, the, I, I, when I did the Hebrews uh, uh, commentary, I studied so many of these commentaries, who spent all their time, who did, who, did Paul really write it? No, it was really this guy or that guy, for which there's no evidence, by the way. And the ones that dwell on the authorship of the epistle miss the point of the epistle, by the way. They get all hung up on that. They seem to, what, really, what it's really all about goes right by them. So it was, a, a, our Hebrews a, a, a commentary was kind of fun because once you recognize the realities, it's clear why he's writing, what he's writing, to whom he's writing, and what it says. It's all very clear. Anyway, moving on. The impact of this little verse I want to talk about. In 1483, in Eisleben, Saxony, a baby boy was born to a poor coal miner. He observed the poverty, so he decided he didn't want that, so he decided to be a lawyer. But in 1501, he entered the University of Erfurt, where he excelled in his studies. However, at the end of his schooling, he got caught in a terrifying storm, during which he made a vow that if he survived that, he would become a monk. He survived the thing, so he, he's good to his word. He entered an Augustinian monastery. Instead of going into law, he went into theology and got a doctorate. But the more he studied, the more troubled he became about his own sin. It became an obsession to him. And he indulged in the most extreme forms of 
self-punishment. And that was very characteristic of the church in those days, the medieval church. But even going through all that, he could never find peace. Finally, in 1509, he decided to make a pilgrimage to Rome to try to get his questions answered. But in, he's on foot. And as he crosses the Alps, he almost dies of a high fever in a monastery there. They nursed him back to health. But while in the monastery, a wise monk, recognizing his frustrations with these issues, says, you need to read the book of Habakkuk. Because he's troubled, you know, about this whole issue. And there's one verse that leapt out at him from Habakkuk, chapter, chapter 2, verse 4. The just shall live by faith. He was haunted by that. He couldn't get it out of his mind. He finally does go to Rome, but he's disgusted with what he finds there. He actually abandons all the reasons he went there. He returns back to the University of Wittenberg, goes on to explore the revolutionary idea of justification by faith that was pointed to him by Habak 2.4, but of course is the central doctrine of the Epistle of Romans. So he ultimately nailed his famous 95 Theses to the door at Wittenberg Castle Church and started a movement that's known today as the Reformation. One of the most important events in modern history from a verse, Habakkuk 2.4. At the Diet of Worms, now that's a strange phrase, the Diet is not a Diet, it's a Council. The Diet of Worms is the Council of a town. The town is Worms, the Diet is the ruling class in the town of Worms. And they excommunicated this guy, whose name is Martin Luther, obviously, as a heretic. And he went on to write commentaries that are classics today. He wrote a lot of hymns, like Mighty Fortresses of God. He translated the entire Bible into German, which remains today as a classic in the Germanic language. So, all because of that little verse that changed the course of history. Okay, let's move on. Now follows a five-fold woe, five woes, if you will, upon the wicked Chaldean oppressor, the Babylonians that are coming. This is going to be presented symmetrically in five stanzas or strophes of three verses each. You ready for this? I, I, the Holy Spirit, from time to time, gets very structured. Other times, he's very free-flowing, but it's interesting. But verses 5 through 8 are is first going to deal with proud ambition. Then they're going to deal, next few verses, he's going to, each one of the groups of three, covetousness, ruthlessness and cruelty, debauchery, and idolatry. Sounds like a list of movies to see tonight, right? Okay. Moving on. Verse 5. Yea, also because he transgressed by wine, he is a proud man, neither keeping at home, who enlarges his desire as hell or Sheol, and is as, is as death and cannot be satisfied, but gathers unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. This is this oppressor that's coming, whose appetites are I impossible to satiate. And uh, in fact, he's saying, trust me, they'll never be satisfied. Nothing satisfies prominence, position, power, or people. They are never reach a level of satisfaction. God thirst drives us. Wine. You know, Nahum, the prophet Nahum makes it clear that Assyria fell through drunkenness. Amos tells us the fall of the northern kingdom was caused by drunkenness. Now Habakkuk tells us that Babylon will fall through their drunkenness. Interesting. Rome did also. What about us? Do we drink a lot of alcohol? Boy, that's just the beginning of it, isn't it? Anyway. Shall not these make up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay. Now you have a little trouble with that last phrase probably. To him that ladeth himself with thick They kept their loan records on clay tablets. What this is really saying, it makes themselves rich with loans. Now you, you don't pick that up until you understand that thick clay was an allusion to the, their, their, their legal records, so to speak. Okay. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and wake th uh, that shall vex thee and thou shalt be for booties unto them? And th he's predict these bad guys that are coming taking over, he's predicting that they're going to fall too, see? Medo Persia uh, forms an alliance that took over Babylon by drying up the river Euphrates, taking it over. That's all recorded in Daniel chapter 5. Cyrus takes over and frees them. That's what ended the Babylonian captivity. And here Habakkuk is anticipating that in the, in the uh, uh, rhetoric of his prophecies here. Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of thy, the people shall spoil thee, because of men's blood and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. In other words, in search of satisfaction, the Babylonians would only experience retribution. The people they devoured would soon devour them. And indeed they did. So that's the first of the five woes, proud ambition. Next one is covetousness. 
Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. This is the second woe now for covetousness and self-aggrandizement. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and hast sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. In other words, thing, the things they are devoted to will soon fall apart is another way of saying it. Okay. How about yours? Are the things that you're devoted to, are they going to fall apart? Wow. Important to realize where your heart is, huh? That's your most important stewardship, by the way. Not your career, not your money, not even your time, your heart. Stewardship of your heart. There's passages there. Hey, moving on, the third woe, ruthlessness and cruelty. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establisheth the city by iniquity. There's a third word, a third woe for murder, pillage, slaughter, and violence. Uh, verse 13. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in, every in, in, in the very fire, and the people shall be weary of themselves for uh, every for very for very vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow! In this um, uh, panorama of woes, we have this little verse thrust at us, Habakkuk 2.14, because this is the purpose of God in all things. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow, think about that a minute. What a gleaming promise glowing through all this gloom. The ultimate purpose of God. What's he talking about here? The establishment of the kingdom from heaven. The Gospel of Matthew uses the phrase 33 times, the kingdom of heaven. It should really say kingdom from heaven. Of and from are the same word in both Hebrew and German. The king, it's the kingdom from heaven. It's the fifth in the list of five in Daniel 2. That's when David's righteous branch sets up his kingdom. That starts in 2 Samuel 7, carries all the way. It's not an Old Testament idea. It goes through the New Testament. That's what Gabriel promises Mary in Luke for, when he announces that Jesus will have the, take the throne of David. And that's the key event in the book of Acts when J, James announced, it quotes from Amos 9 that the tabernacle of David is going to be reestablished. That's not the temple of Solomon. That's the tabernacle of David, the king. It's a palace, not a temple. Anyway, let's move on here. Debauchery is the next one. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, and puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. That's not about alcoholism, it's about something far nastier. The fourth woe, exploit of partying and drunkenness is a polite way to talk about it. Thou art filled with shame for glory, drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. Ooh, wow. Is that in the Bible? The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. Your manipulations will be retributed on yourselves. Your own nakedness will be exposed. And we could talk about AIDS and a lot of other things. Let's not get into all that here. But we do hear about the cup of his fury in Jeremiah 25 and in Obadiah and Revelation 15 and so on. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee in the spoil of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and for all the violence of the land of the city and of all that dwell therein. Whew. Now we get to the worst of them all. We've talked about ambition, covetousness, ruthlessness, cruelty, debauchery. No, 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 no. The big one is idolatry. You know, we tend to, we tend to think that's an old-fashioned idea, of you know, bowing before wooden or stone idols. That's a very naive characterization of idolatry. Idolatry is anything that deviates you from the worship of the living God. He continued, What profit if the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it? The molten image, the teacher of lies, the maker of his work, trusteth therein to make dumb idols. Woe to him that saith to the wood, Awake! To the dumb stone, Arise! It shall teach! <laughs> Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. Woe unto him. This is again the fifth woe for the greatest sin of all, idolatry. The scripture says twice, we become like the gods we worship. Is the, is, uh, are are um, stone idols cold? 
rigid. If you worship them, you'll become cold and rigid. Is the world materialistic, unforgiving, ruthless? If you worship the world, you'll become all those things. We become like the gods we worship. That's why it's so important that we worship the living God. Because if we do that, we become like Him. We want to be like Christ. What a contrast. Ooh. There are three steps to the downfall of a nation. This is in Judges and Isaiah both. The first step is spiritual apostasy. The second step is immorality. The third step is political anarchy. Those are the steps. The primary problem wasn't the political anarchy. That's a symptom, not the cause. Even immorality was also simply a, a symptom. That may surprise you. Gee, I thought that's the root cause. No. Even the immorality is a symptom of what? It all begins with spiritual apostasy, turning away from the true and living God. That's where America started to go south. Circa 1962 and 3, Madeleine Murray O'Hare won the lawsuits. The Supreme Court took prayer out of schools. The whole concat Roe versus Wade. You, you, the whole list of things. That he, there are 84 charts of social indicators of America. And if you look at them, they're all slightly improving. Teenage marriages, out of wedlock, all, all the different indicators. They're getting slightly better and better and better up until 1962, 63. Then suddenly they all turn the other way. 84 different indications. That's when everything starts to go south. Because that's when we ushered God out of the schools, couldn't pray publicly anymore, and on it goes. On it goes. But the Lord is in his holy temple and all the earth keeps silence before him. Ooh, boy, oh boy. God is saying, I know what I'm doing. I'm on the throne. Pipe down. Trust me. That's what he's saying to uh, Habakkuk. Okay, we made it to chapter 3. This is his prayer. He started out with questions. The third chapter, the short one, is his prayer. The, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon the Shigenoth. If anyone tell me what that is, I'd love to know. No one knows. The scholars believe it has something to do with music, but they're not sure what. There's a lot of speculations, but no proof. The psalm of chapter 3 is viewed as the most magnificent Hebrew poetry, by the way. And the word Selah appears in verse 3, 9, and 13. That's a word you only see in the psalms. And a lot of people have different theories about what it means. I personally am convinced from the writings of Bollinger and others, what it means is simply stop, look, and listen. It's a pause to... Absorb what you've got so far. The Shigunoth is found in the singular. This is a plural here, but it's a singular in Psalm 7, so we think it's a musical instrument of some kind, but we're not sure. Some kind of music accompanied the song. It implies great excitement, triumphal style is the flavor of, of, of the thing, apparently. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years made known in wrath. Remember mercy. In other words, literally, let your work live. You know, we talk of showers of blessing. He's talking about showers of mercy. And I love what uh, J. Vernon McGee, he, he quoted in his commentary, he quoted from Portia, Shakespeare's uh, Mer Merchant of Ven Venice, where she says, The quality of mercy is not stained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. Very elegant. You have to give it to the bard. He had a way with words. God came from Teman. That's, uh, in effect... Uh, Edom, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise. Now, now, there are a lot of alternative views. What we think this prayer is paralleling is actual history, history that, involve, that involves three different men. Abraham in the first group, Moses in the next group, and Joshua in the next. But that's conjecture. It's just the flavor of the sweep of Habakkuk's prayer here. But that's our estimate. I'll show you why. The word Selah, of course, is a term reserved for Psalms. I believe it means stop, look, and listen. Gather yourself. Cause. It's, a, it's a pause. 
And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and the burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth, beheld, and drove us under the nations, and everlasting mountains were scattered, perpetual hills did bow, his ways are everlasting. And some people speculate this, this is, he had Moses on his mind. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Kushan is Ethiopia. And there's a speculation that the illusion here is Moses' campaign against Ethiopia when he was operating as Pharaoh's son before he peeled out. So it's an interesting possibility. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? That thou didst ride upon the horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still. Ooh, really? In their habitation, at the light of thine arrows, they went at the beginning, uh, at the shining of thy glittering spear. That sounds like Joshua. Uh, in, uh, from the, in Joshua 10, but uh, in verses 11 through 15, it, you, get, you, can, you can justify the idea that he had Joshua on his mind here. The miracle of Gibeon, of course, was at Joshua 10, verse 12, when the sun stood still and so forth. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thrash the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. See, this is God doing all this, but in the days of the ones we're talking about that wentest forth in the salvation of thy people, even for salvation of thine anointed, that woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck, Selah. Thou didst strike through with his staves the head of the village, his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. The rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of the great waters. Whew! See, Habakkuk not only heard a sermon from God, he now has a vision of God. This is God he's talking about, but in those days, of course. And rather, very, obviously, very eloquently. Some view this passage historically. The descent of God from Mount Sinai when the law was given, wandering through Midian, through Teman, verse 3, over the mountains, through the Red Sea, on their way to the Promised Land. Others suggest that it's prophetic of Jesus Christ. Teman is Edom, Basra, stained with blood and all that, from Isaiah 63. Um, it's possible, but I don't see that here. Some also imply that the effects of one of Mars near passbys may be in view. And if you don't want to know what that's about, you've got to get into, our, get into our commentary on Joshua, where Patton, Hatch, and Steinhauer built the model that uh, seems to have some corroboration, interestingly enough. Anyway, the result of all this, he's reminded of the past in this prayer, but he's God is revealing, he's reminded of the past, revealing the future, to be renewed in the present. To review what God has done for you in the past, anticipate what he will do for you in the future, and you will have peace in the present. I like that patterning. When you pray, like he did, review what God's done for you in the past, anticipate what he will do for you in the future, and that's all laid out. And if you do that, you'll have peace in the present. And we're going to need that peace, because it's going to get turbulent. Verse 16, when I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. See, earlier he said, Lord, do something. Now he's saying, now I tremble at what you will do. Because God is going to take over, and he's going to be serious about it. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But what does that mean for those left behind? You know, it's interesting, there are many of us that had the feeling, a uh, very sense of, of eminence of the rapture back in the 70s, early 70s. That was a very widespread attitude. If God had come back then, and the rapture had taken place then, there's a lot of people in this room that probably would not be in the kingdom. So every day that he tarries is a day of gathering for the kingdom. Let's keep that in mind. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yes, but what does that do for those that are left behind? Habakkuk continues here, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, and labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, 
The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. In other words, he said, even though my country will be devastated, the markets will crash, my house will be burned and looted, and there's blood in the streets. Ha, huh. nevertheless, yet, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Wow. That's called an exclamation point. Rejoice means to jump up and down, by the way. And the word for joy means to spin around. And, the, and some of the Negro spirituals pick up on those two. Jump down, spin around, pick a bale of cotton, you know. Well, they're actually getting that from the Hebrews, believe it or not. Anyway. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 In everything give thanks. I want you to notice that verse doesn't say for everything give thanks. No, 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 no. In everything, good and bad, in everything, give thanks. Not for thanks, in thanks. In everything. In everything, give thanks. Wow. I rejoice in the Lord, not the problem. The Lord God is my strength, Habakkuk says, and he will make my feet like hind's feet, and he will make me walk upon mine hide places. And then the last little, first, little instruction, mechanical footnote here, to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. Because this prayer was to be sung. It's a psalm. See? Okay. Chapter 1, Habakkuk was in the valley. Chapter 2, he was in the tower. Chapter 3, he's now on the mountaintop. Now on the mountaintop. That's the way we should be. In the valley, you then go into your tower. Think about what he has done. Review what he has promised to do. And you'll have peace. And you'll end up on the mountaintop. I mean, string dance means that he's probably a priest before he was a prophet. Fine, well, and good. Let's look at contrast between Jonah and uh, Habakkuk. They're similar in some respects, different in others. Jonah ministered, of course, to the Assyrians. Habakkuk to the Babylonians. Jonah ran from God when he heard what God was going to do. Habakkuk ran to God, wondering what God would do. Jonah saw the salvation of God to the Gentiles. Indeed he did. Habakkuk saw the sovereignty of God through the Gentiles. Ooh, that's interesting. Jonah's story ends in foolishness as he worries about that stupid gourd. Book of Jonah, the first three chapters are fabulous. What is the fourth chapter there for? Well, for a lot of good reasons. Habakkuk's story ends in faith as he trusts God. As Hamlet might say, devoutly to be wished, huh? Jonah had to learn inside a fish. <laughs> Habakkuk learned in the high tower. Where do you want to learn your lessons about faith? In the fish or in the tower? I think I'll take the tower. Are there always storms? Remember, Jonah had seaweed wrapped around his head. By the way, I believe he died. I believe he died in the fish and was brought back to life, by the way. Then he becomes the complete type that Jesus himself points to being the anti-type of, incidentally. And that supported the text, too, by the way. He was in Sheol. See? Do you feel cramped? Always in the dark? <laughs> Are you inside a fish or the tower? Don't have to answer me. Think about it. The hour is later in God's clock than any one of us realizes. The hour is later than any of us realize. We need a sense of urgency in our spiritual lives. Prophecy should be studied not as an idle curiosity, but to ascertain the will of God now for each of our lives to enable us to move into the center of that place of blessing that he talks about in chapter 1, verse 5. We made it. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.